Nucor Gold is up two thirds in the past month after an updated preliminary economic assessment on its Anchi Gold project in Ghana. Luke Alexander is president and CEO. Luke, welcome back to Kitco. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Michael. I'm going to talk about the stock move in a minute, but maybe first just introduce it again to the Anchi project. Yeah, so Nucor Gold, we've got the Enchi project in Ghana. It's a district scale exploration project that's fundamentally underpinned by very robust economics. We did put out that updated PEA uh, at the end of last week. It outlined very strong, uh, robust economics for the project at an 1850 gold price and after tax $371 million US NPV. So we've started to see some of that get reflected into the stock. But my view is we've got a big re-rating opportunity coming as the market starts to recognize the value of our project. So district scale, fundamentally underpinned by a very strong uh, economic study, and then a management team who's truly aligned with shareholders. So we own, between management and board, 22% of the companies. That's money we've invested alongside investors. So we're truly aligned from that perspective. So that's uh, high-level Nucor Gold. Uh, the region has been challenged right now with uh, some of the coups and some uh, political uh, instability right now. How's the, uh, how, how is it where you're working right now? So I'd say some parts of Africa have been challenged. Where we are specifically in Ghana, it's been a great jurisdiction to operate in. It's got a very supportive government to move projects forward. Uh, it's also, from a security perspective, very safe. But what we often in, uh, point to is the fact that you've got three of the top 10 largest gold producers on the planet there with significant operations. Newmont being the largest gold producer on the planet, they're investing an additional billion dollars into Ghana. That will take their Ahafo project, which sits along the Sefwi Bibiani belt to the north of us, to their second largest producing asset globally, after the Nevada Gold Complex. So again, I can tell you it's a great place, it's wonderful, but when you've got the biggest company on the planet investing that kind of capital, I think it speaks for itself. So as a company, Nucor, we're very fortunate that we amassed such a large land package that w when we did, and obviously now we're focused on unlocking the value from that uh, project. How's the infrastructure? Have you got water there? We've got access to water. We've also importantly got a paved road that cuts through the middle of our project with a power line running beside it. So that's one of the things that again, really helps the NPV of this project is the fact that it's a low CapEx project and we're able to leverage all of that infrastructure that we've got on our project. We've got the town of Enchi, which sits about 15 kilometers away from, uh, from where the processing plant will be. So it's far enough away that there's no issues when it comes time to building it. But we've got um, you know, a university campus there, we've got hospitals, we've got high school. So all of our employees can live in Enchi and easily commute to the project. So that obviously helps in terms of the overall uh, capital to build this project, which is about $106 million of initial upfront capital. Can you talk about your social license and ability to operate there? Yeah, so we've been operating in and around um, Enchi and had the Enchi project for a number of years. Our country manager, Dan Wilson, he's worked in the, in the Enchi area for the past dozen years. So we've got very good relationships with all of the local stakeholders. Uh, we offer the locals jobs first where we can. We also recently, uh, at the end of 2023, completed a social and environmental baseline study across our project, which is one of the key things that's required for applying for a mining lease. And we um, had very good feedback from that study. So we're really well positioned to ultimately push this uh, project forward towards a production and ultimately put it into production. Um, and, uh, and, you know, part of that is obviously the local communities and working closely with them. Um, are you financed? Uh, so we've got right now, if you look at the um, cash balance at the end of 2023, we had $3.7 million in the bank. If you look at our previous cash balance from the quarter prior to that, it was about $4.9 million. So we burn about a million dollars a quarter. Again, as 22% owners of the business, we want to see as much money as possible going into the ground, as well as we've got about uh, 16, 17 million warrants that are in the money. 
Strike price of 20 cents a share. We're trading at about 32 cents Canadian today. Uh, those warrants expire at the end of the June. We've already started seeing some of our major institutional investors exercising those warrants. So we'll get an additional about $3.3 million coming in from that. So you take the 3.7, the 3.3, we would be at roughly $7 million, which gives us lots of runway to, uh, to push the company forward. Uh, Luke, I want to step back and then just talk about where the mining industry is right now. You have a background in finance uh, before you uh, took over the reins at uh, Nucor. Uh, we were talking before, um, you know, gold hitting several all-time highs right now. Copper's been making a nice run. I think last I checked about 20% up year to date. And then we've seen all of this great M&A that's uh, been happening right now. Um, you were talking, though, uh, that uh, really a catalyst that we're going to have to see is we're going to have to see it in Q2. What do you mean by Q2 and what has to happen? Yeah, so I think one of the things we all we've obviously saw is in Q1 is we saw gold start to move and, and, and have a real uh, appreciation. That move started, you know, into Q1. So the real impact of $2,300, $2,400 gold will it wasn't reflected in the Q1 numbers. Uh, as we, you know, push through Q2 and assuming we stay in this same range, you know, that impact of this higher gold price will really start to flow through a number of the majors, um, you know, uh, financials and, you know, fall to the bottom line. So that free cash flow generation from these higher gold prices will have a real positive impact on uh, on on the producing companies. And inevitably, when you look at the generalist investor, which in my view is what really, you know, drives the outperformance of gold equities is when that generalist investor starts to come into the sector. And when they look at, you know, gold companies, they're looking at them off in the same way they'll look at consumer products companies or banks. You know, they look at EBITDA, they look at free cash flow, they look at price earnings, um, uh, uh, ratios. So once we start to see that impact of a positive gold price really start to flow through, all of those companies will start to look very attractive using those generalist metrics, which then should hopefully bring those generalist investors back into the gold equities, which can have a real positive impact on the overall um, sector. The other thing I think is important just to touch on is inflation. Obviously, the sector's seen a lot of inflation over the last few years, and every sector globally has. All of our you know, households have seen inflation. But you know, we've started to already see with some of the forecasts that you know, companies are talking about flatlining of expenses going down in some cases. What that'll lead to is margin expansion. We've been seeing margin compression over the last number of years. So $2,400 gold, if you've got an $1,800 all-in sustaining cost, is the same as having an $1,800 gold price and a $1,200 all-in sustaining cost. You've got $600 of margin on both of that. So as we start to see that margin expanding with an ever-increasing gold price, that again is what should bring a lot of investors back to the sector. Uh you touched on it before, and that was talking about uh, M and A. Um, I was interested more in uh, what you're seeing specifically regarding uh, mergers and acquisitions in uh, Africa. Uh, of course, we had the big headline uh, that was uh, maybe about uh, two weeks ago, where we saw uh, potentially floating a thirty billion dollar plus if uh, the um, if, uh, BHP is able to uh, take out uh, Anglo, which is uh, providing some uh, momentum into the space. Well, we often joke that BHP Anglo deal was the second biggest news last week after Nucor's uh, announcement of our of our PEA. So, you know, we were kind of hitting the headlines in the uh, in the same way there. I, I think you took a bigger. Uh, I think you took a better leg up. So uh, maybe that's uh, the reason there we why. Go. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, kidding aside, I mean, Africa has been you know, without a doubt, a go-to place for companies looking to buy projects and assets. And, you know, we've got Osino, who recently had a bid from Dundee Precious, um, uh, from Dundee Precious Metals, which then got outbid by uh, Yin Tai. So a competitive bidding situation for that project in Namibia. You've got Orcorp, similar situation, not one bidder, but multiple bidders. Silver Corp was in there. Perseus came over the top. Uh, we've got Tieto, who just got, uh, uh, who just announced that they've had an increase on the uh, hostile bid uh, for that for that project. So, you know, I think it highlights that Africa is a go-to jurisdiction. You know, 
really well endowed from a mineral perspective, but then also the ability to get projects built and put into production is something that's uh, very, very attractive for, uh, for companies. Uh, specifically in, in, in Ghana, uh, we saw you know, um, the announcement between uh, Goldfields and Anglos on the merging of that asset. Uh, we've seen the Cardinal project get taken out and now is being built. Uh, so there's been a lot of activity in um, uh, in Ghana as well, and there's a scarcity of projects, which is uh, which is one of the uh, you know which is one of the benefits for companies like us at Nucor. Uh, financing is really the lifeblood uh, for the juniors right now. So uh, we saw the uh, Rio Two have its uh, 23 million financing. What I've heard though from uh, people uh, talking to Kai Hoffman is, is that it's still a very selective uh, financing uh, sector right now, financing environment right now. Yeah, I mean, Rio too, I think they went out for 10 million and it got upsized to 23 million. Uh, I actually hope it remains a selective financing market and it's really just the quality projects that get financed, the ones that stand out you know, from the hundreds of projects that are out there because inevitably because it is a cyclical business and as the market heats up and as people you know get uh exuberant inevitably powerpoint presentations get dusted off and every project out there gets financed inevitably you know when things correct or normalize those projects that don't have quality assets that don't have quality teams that aren't at a stage that should be getting financed inevitably, you know, the stock prices lag or collapse and shareholders end up, um, you know, suffering. And then, you know, it becomes more challenging for the overall sector to perform, you know, through the cycle. So I hope it remains selective and that's probably counterintuitive to what a lot of people um, say, but because we've got a high quality asset that we've been continuing to push along over the and and advance over the last few years despite it being a tough environment we've got 45 percent institutional ownership deep pocketed long-term focused investors who recognize the quality of this project and invest through the peaks and troughs you know i hope it remains a selective market and I hope, you know, the money goes into the market and buys the stock so that we see the performance as opposed to focusing on financing companies and topping up treasuries. Investors can always go buy in the market. And that's where you really make your share gains and appreciation is when stocks go up. So slightly counterintuitive to probably what a lot of people um, talk about. But because we have such a quality asset that we've been de-risking and moving through through the tough times, we hope that continues. Uh, Luke, lastly, the next 12 months, you've got your uh, updated uh, PEA. What do you do next? So we put out the updated uh, PEA last week. Obviously, it outlined very uh, positive and robust economics, $371 million after-tax NPV. At a spot gold price, call it $2350. We're looking at an after-tax NPV of $630, after-tax IRR of 92%. So these are very attractive metrics for a project. We'll be out there talking about it over the next, um, uh, over the next few weeks, meeting with our major investors, meeting with the board, and coming up with a plan to continue to de-risk the project, continue to explore uh, at our NCHI project, both from a de um, delineation perspective, as well as a grassroots exploration. Uh, and in the meantime, we continue to do a huge amount of met work. So we'll, we'll get those results out. Uh, we're doing hydrological geotech work. We're doing condemnation drilling across where the heap leach pad would go. So all of that stuff is, is critical to get it into production, to move it to a construction decision. May not be as exciting for the market, um, but uh, it's crucial work that needs to get done that we'll continue to focus on. Luke, thanks for speaking with Kitco. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Michael. My name is Michael McRae here with Kitco Mining.